So I, uh, I've been doing web standards for a long time, and uh, I use various metaphors. Some of them are a little uh, gory. I hope that's all right. I think it's appropriate. When you, when you work on the web, as I have for a long time, you have to be tough. You can't be a crybaby like Luke. You have to be like um, Ash, Bruce Campbell's character. Um, and this is because the web is not owned by anybody. So it's not going to have Apple's WWDC event every, every year. It's not going to have a new, uh, fantastically documented, beautiful, fairly consistent set of APIs. It's going to be a rolling standards party um, where you might get your hand cut off, but you might actually get some, something really amazing built that works across billions of people's machines. And uh, JavaScript w was a key part of that. Um, it, it started very uh, modestly as this sidekick language to Java. Uh, and now it's, it's completely replaced Java as a plugin in browsers. Um, and Flash and other things. <clears throat> so it's given people such ambitions about the web that they thought maybe we can make an operating system out of the web. That hasn't happened. It's been difficult. Firefox OS, which I uh, was a co-founder of, did not get traction. We started a little late, and Mozilla didn't uh, lean in early. And so when we finally got going late, it was, it was too late. Android uh, had become cheap enough and good enough, which it wasn't for a long time that you couldn't get your foot in the door as Firefox OS hoped to at the low end of the market. Tizen from Samsung had been trying the same thing for a long time and a lot of money rumored to be 10 billion uh, and didn't get traction either. People think the web is now going away because of smartphones or mobile. I, I think this is not true. There are, um, there are important browsers on mobile like Facebook, which is a browser. It's not a great browser. You end up loading content and you, you, you go back to the app because the web view isn't very good for viewing that content. But you do get links. You do get um, the ability to, to browse and even search. I, I have this concern about the web and mobile, though. I've heard this story from uh, Cory Doctorow. He said that he talked to Google. They did a study of millennials, millennials who use smartphones almost, almost exclusively, and they do not search. And the Google people were horrified. They said. What do you mean you don't search? Tell us, tell us something about yourselves. We'll look for you in our, in our search engine. We'll see if we can find you. And they couldn't find a trace of these test subjects, these millennials. And um, they said, how do you learn anything? And the millennials said, we ask our friends on social media. <laughs> and they send us links. But they do send links, and the links get loaded in web views. So the web is still there. Links are still there. Search is, is in some kind of trouble. Um, in, in, in emerging markets like in India, you, you have people with um, internet-capable devices that are typically phones. So they, if they do e-commerce, like with the number one e-commerce site, Flipkart, they can, they can use the site or the app. But something happened in 2015. People got worried because Flipkart took down its website. It was like, we're number one. You have our app. You don't need our website. It turned out they were working with Google to bring it back, which they did as a progressive web app. And Here's something from Flipkart's blog, tech blog about progressive web apps. And it cites the Extensible Web Manifesto, which is this uh, website you can read about um, the philosophy that led to progressive web apps and, and other innovations lately. I'm a signer of that manifesto. Um, it's called the EWM for short. And it, it is mainly about standards bodies and competing browsers adding from the bottom up to provide sort of the kernel functionality, this is a theme I'll return to, that you need to build great applications on the web, and not trying to create frameworks, of which we have many. Uh, how many people here know what a progressive web app is? <laughs> it, it's kind of a heavy term. Um, it's really wrapped around service workers. So service workers are amazing. Service workers, you know, you have like, I think that's Happy Cat TIE Fighter. And it's mashing up Star Trek and Star Wars. Service workers are a way of doing, um, let's say, something that runs in your browser and outlives the page it came from. And it can be like a web server that's local. It can handle I.O. It can handle offline operation. It can remember things for you. It can cache things for you. It makes it much, much better to build um, applications that act more like native apps 
but it's still a web API. It's still part of the web. It's proposed uh, in W3C. It's going forward. It's in Chrome, Firefox, and I believe Edge. And it's, it's on the, the WebKit track, so maybe Apple will do it someday. Um, they have this sort of grudging note about, oh, I guess we'll have to do service workers. Um, and you know, service workers, you can have them running independent of pages. Maybe you can have them talking to each other. What we're really reinventing here is something um, like an operating system above the operating system. And, and so what's the problem? Is there a problem with the web versus native? Um, I mean, there's always a problem on the web. There's always insufficient APIs to match the shiniest thing from Apple that they launched at the last WWDC. There's, there, there are problems with security, but actually the web is, is, is more, I think, is better secured in a lot of ways than, than many uh, versions of extant operating systems. Um, the web is not minimal. I keep coming back to this, and it bothers people because they have to cope with the old APIs. Sometimes they have to use them. Over time, you can ignore them. And, and so what happens is the web does evolve. It changes. And sometimes you even break compatibility, but it's usually by accident when nobody cares. Um, and, and people are doing, as I say, web views in native apps. It's, it's so-called hybrid apps are very common. If you think about Amazon or any other big e-commerce site, they're not going to reinvent their entire catalog's presentation using native widgets on two or more operating systems. It makes no sense. They're going to use a web engine, and they do. So hybrid apps live. The web lives. Search is in trouble. Millennials ask their friends on social media. Uh, but um, the innovation cycle is, is, is happening. It's, it's happening even with... Um, you know, IE is still out there. Microsoft with Edge is, is back in business. They have even open sourced their JavaScript engine, which is amazing. You can do things about problems that were really hard to solve, even in native apps in older versions of Android, like making them animate at 60 frames a second, making them start quickly, making them respond quickly. You can go wrong with any programming language, but with the web, of course, you couldn't even do some of these things until the last few years. And now, uh, thanks to things like React Canvas and WebAssembly or Asm.js, which prefigured it, which I'll talk about a bit more, uh, it's getting better. It, it, it's not <coughs> ever going to be perfect. Native's not perfect either, but it's getting closer. It's converging. The lack of minimalism bothers people, so I, I decided to put up some minimal art. Um, I particularly like um, Free Ride down there. Um, that's a good, that sculpture. Uh, le leaning slab, I don't know, it's, it's, it's too minimal for me. <laughs> so if you accept a certain amount of, of evolutionary um, growth and the cost of it, that you have, um, you know, we have an appendix. I think that might have some immune system function. You have junk DNA that isn't actually junk. It's not fully understood. The web has that, too. Um, the web is, is actually part of why Rob Pike wrote systems software research is irrelevant, um, presented at Usenix 2000. There were other reasons, like the PC, the commodification of, of computing. Um, the web had a lot to do with it, and JavaScript, too. But systems research is obviously thriving at places like Google. They're, they're building huge systems. They're doing interesting research. They don't always publish it, uh, and Rob Pike works there. Um, but I'm an old Unix hacker, and what I think killed systems research and what Pike identifies as one of the, the factors is Unix. Unix kind of simplified the operating system, the monolithic monitor, until it, it, it swept everything aside. Um, all, all the grandiose ideas about microkernels and, and you know, um, there, there is interesting operating system research. We still haven't coped with parallelism, hardware parallelism very well uh, in most of our uh, code and even in operating systems. But Unix happened and there was no sort of looking back after that. And it's beautifully minimal. This is the version 6 Unix uh, system call table. You know, the, the, <laughs> when I was young, I, I was just enthralled by Fork, read, write, open, close. IOCTAL, pretty ugly, uh, kind of a barn door device driver uh, API, uh, kitchen sink API. But, and, and of course, as, as Unix evolved, just like the web, you got larger system call tables with craziness and, and you know, gnosis stubbing and binary compatibility issues. But Unix is still very nice, and we have a lot of code written essentially for Unix. Um, you, know, you can even run Linux now on, on, on Windows, apparently. 
the web needs to be more like this. There's, there's always this pressure on the web. You want to sort of try a web page without installing a program. You want to leave it and have the resources be unloaded. That's important. But people are now used to um, powerful apps on their phones. And the app model isn't great. I, I install apps, and I, then I'm stuck with them crying at me to be updated. Uh, I turn on automatic updates, and they still don't get updated, so I have to find a good Wi-Fi and keep trying to update them. The, the web rules at that. It's really great. You just go there and, and load it, and it works, usually. Um, so there's something, <laughs> something I wanted to say about standards process. There was a meeting at, at um, Google uh, Munich uh, just early last week. And it's a, uh, it's a meeting I missed, in part to come here and speak today. I had another uh, obligation to speak in London uh, next week. So I, I missed the standards meeting. And I, I feel bad about this, because when I miss the standards meetings, things tend to fall apart. I don't know why this is. <laughs> I, I think I have some moral authority still. Even though JavaScript is 21, what's the age at which you can you know, go drink in, in Germany? Uh, oh. <laughs> well, so. JavaScript's like my bad millennial. It's, it's trying to live in my basement still. But I've kicked it out. It's 21. And I didn't, I didn't go to this meeting. And at the meeting, just as I predicted last November, Google started acting like Microsoft. And you know, Microsoft uh, being more open, having open source their engine, still couldn't prevail. I think Apple was there. They might have actually helped on some of the issues, like tail calls. Um, we're making progress. I, I'm a little worried that, that the Google is Microsoft problem is real. That, they have 60-something percent blended mobile desktop browser share. And that's very powerful. But it's not 95%. It's not what Internet Explorer had in 2002, I believe, when we started Phoenix, and, and which became Firefox, which allowed us to turn that around. And when you don't have 95% share, you can't really control the standards. So things fell into disharmony at this meeting. I'm going to have to come to the next meeting, which is in Microsoft Redmond in, in the state of Washington in the US, um, end of July, and try to patch things up. In spite of this, things are making progress. Async await, I, I think you may have seen this. This is a nice syntax for using promises. It allows you to write async functions and await promise returning functions and uh, not have to use generators or, or uh, callbacks so explicitly. Um, the decorators proposal from Yehuda Katz, uh, this, this actually was, I think, in trouble at the last meeting last week. Uh, I'm not sure what's going to happen. I think in, it has support from Microsoft. It should be revived and make progress. But the politics have gotten a little difficult. And that's another problem with the web. If you don't have enough balance in the, the browser market, if you don't have competitors competing not only for market share but for developer mind share, but balancing each other, then you can have standards stagnate. And, and this is another reason why native runs ahead. Obviously, when Apple did the iPhone, they had um, you know, almost a, a clean slate to work on in some ways. Ericsson had built a similar device. But they tried using the web at first, and they extended CSS. They added you know, rounded border radius properties and, and transforms and animations. That was all great, and it should have been standardized quickly, but it wasn't. It took a long time to get standardized, and I think part of it was the lack of balance in, in the market. The, the iPhone was new, and Android wasn't very good then. It took a while to get Android up to snuff and, and get this, this uh, sort of these innovations standardized. Um, decorators from Yehuda Katz, if you know about ES6, how many people here use ES6, use Babel or, or Buble? Or? <laughs> something. Uh, there, there are various compilers. And you can, <laughs> they have crazy names, but um, you can use not only ES6, but there are things that some of these compilers add that are already uh, being standards tracked uh, for the next uh, version of ECMAScript. Maybe, let's hope. Decorators might be one of these things. And it allows you to use this sort of uh, runtime metaprogramming syntax with at, like you might be familiar with from Java and the name of a function to call. Here is non-enumerable, and it's just a function. And it's, it's, it ha there's a careful staging required to get this to be executed when the class uh, declaration is evaluated. And it can do things to the sort of runtime um, object uh, protocol that began with ES5. If, if you know what uh, a property descriptor is, it sets the enumerable property to false. It makes the kid count getter on this class per person 
not visible to the for in loop to other means of, of inspecting objects uh, for enumerable properties. So that's convenient. But you can do anything with it. You can make a, a higher order function that returns a function and call that after the at. Again, it's, it's runtime metaprogramming sort of at the declaration processing time. And this one um, just generalizes to allow you to flip enumerability according to a parameter. Just shows that you can, you can have extra expressions in, in sort of call um, functions that return functions when you're using decorators. So people writing classes do need decorators. I think when you, when you start adding classes as shorthand for the prototypal pattern, which we did with ES6, you know, pe some people got upset and said, you're making JavaScript into Java, and I would never do that. When, when, when we did um, Mocha in 1995, uh, I did a, a demo and a prototype that became the shipping engine in Netscape 2 in 10 days in May. And Mark Andreessen called it Mocha, but he couldn't fight for the right to ship it that way because of uh, some trademark excuse, but mainly that Netscape wanted to use the Java trademark, the, the mojo behind Java, the, the momentum that was in the market around Sun's Java in 1995, and make this sort of sidekick language. Um, so we, we, even though it was a rush job and, and there was no way I could have put classes in in the time that was allotted, I also would have been in big trouble with Sun Microsystems, the owner of Java <laughs> at the time, creator of Java, James Gosling was there, if I'd added classes because the sidekick language can't have classes. Only the big, big brother language can have classes. But over time, as people used the prototypal inheritance features of JavaScript, they figured out it's good to have class syntax. It's more convenient. There's less rope to hang yourself with, less room for error. Uh, you can have things like super expressions, which are, are hard to do otherwise. And so we have class syntax. How many people actually use classes in, in ES6? Don't be shy. It's all right. <laughs> it's allowed. Um, and, and so how many people uh, would, would use decorators if they were there? Good, good. OK, we'll, we'll have to get the standards body back on its feet. Um, <laughs> The, the other thing that we did at Mozilla that I'm pretty proud of in 2012, I think, starting was um, something called ASM.js. This was a way of, of optimizing a subset of JavaScript to run pretty much at the same speed as safe machine code, kind of like what um, native client, portable native client at Google at the time were doing. And it, it, it's an ugly assembly-like subset of JavaScript. It's a good thing that in 1995 I did add those bitwise shift operators and bitwise logical operators to, to JavaScript. Th those came from you know, C originally through C++ through Java. Because those, plus a few other things like typed arrays from WebGL, allowed ASM.js to be born. And ASM.js, as a subset of JavaScript, can run in any JavaScript engine. It may not run as fast as it should, but it can run. That was one of the key insights. When you're evolving the web, it's better to have something run slower than not at all. Uh, if it's too slow, maybe not at all is better. But, but at some acceptable amount of performance degradation, it's much better to have an evolutionary path where you can say, hey, get a faster browser, or oh, we're working on it, here comes the new engine. And that's what happened. Uh, first in, in Firefox with the SpiderMonkey engine with the Odin Monkey um, optimizing uh, compiler for ASM.js, and then uh, happy to say we got Microsoft interested in this with some secret meetings, uh, which I guess can be public now, because they started optimizing for ASM.js. And you will even find they trans translated some OdinMonkey Mozilla code, which is Apache licensed on purpose, so they could do this. And it's in the Chakra core. So Microsoft is actually learning from Mozilla and doing some things technically and sort of open source things that helped them advance the state of play in the standards. And once, I think, Microsoft and Mozilla showed that you could make very fast JavaScript that could be a compile target for C++ games in particular, um, like Unity and Epic uh, Unreal Engine games, things got better. Um, the, the V8 people, I think, had a fight last year with the portable native client people. I heard there was blood on the ground afterwards. Um, JavaScript won. It, 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 it's not necessarily the best. It's just that it's, it's everywhere. It can be optimized. And because it's, it's got this shorter evolutionary path than trying to get all the other engines to do something like portable native client, it won. 
And you know, I make no apology for it. I'm not too embarrassed by it. It's just a, sort of like a fact of life, like biological evolution. But there's more to do. And so now, all four of the big browser vendors are working in earnest on GitHub, if you can believe it, on WebAssembly. They have an executable specification you can read about. Uh, there are compilers, not just MScript and the original from Alon Sakai, but many compilers now that are targeting Asm.js. You're seeing Asm.js uh, and WebAssembly in the future modules showing up inside other applications. Just the whole thing isn't cross-compiled from C++, it's just one library is to go fast. I think even Kim.com was doing this a couple of years ago for one of, their, uh, one of his things. Um, and I'll get some demos of this that are fun. Um, as I mentioned, Chocolate Core is on GitHub. Um, Chrome is, is working on WebAssembly. There's a WebAssembly uh, compiler for SpiderMonkey. What is WebAssembly? It's hard to visualize. It's another syntax for JavaScript. Initially, it's co-expressive with Asm.js. So you have two ways of loading code. What's good about WebAssembly is it's a bit code for parse trees. So it's, it's very concise. It loads a lot faster than Asm.js, which has you know, the eight-letter function keyword one of my <laughs> poorer choices inspired by awk, which is kind of long. And you, you, know, you can gzip it, but still, there's a certain cost to it, and you have to unzip it to compile it. So with WebAssembly, you get this concise bit code, which induces parse trees, which are you know, inherently valid in the sense that there's no bad go-tos or, or dangerous code there. It's sort of self-verifying. It might be a nonsense program, but it's not going to go wrong. And um, you can use WebAssembly. There are some demos. Um, that you can find online. I'll, I'll, I'll try to show one um, in a minute. When you start going down this route of WebAssembly and you start reinventing Unix, you start going into the path Unix went in the late 80s uh, when processes were considered too heavyweight, you start adding threads. And I said that we should never add threads to JavaScript, and I'm still alive, so um, they aren't quite there yet, but there is definitely a, a move to add shared memory threads to WebAssembly. And again, this sort of evolutionary argument I made earlier about having Asm.js as a, a prequel to WebAssembly wants to push threads and the shared array buffer memory idea into JavaScript as well as WebAssembly. If we had WebAssembly already, maybe we could keep the threads out of JavaScript. But at this point, there's a good chance threads will go into JavaScript and I'll become a zombie. Um, if you look at, at WebAssembly as a bit code, you, you don't know what you're looking at. If you want to see it in a dev tool, there are several proposals for syntax. The one I like, I hope it's still going, I'm not sure, is S expressions. So <laughs> it's like revenge for how I was lured to Netscape. They said, come and do scheme in the browser. And this was in um, early 1995 after I'd refused a recruiting attempt in 1994, like an idiot. So I went in 95, and they said, do scheme in the browser. It'll be fun. But when I got there, they said, oh, yeah, we're, we're doing Java. Sorry. It has to look like Java. Make it look like Java. And so there was no S expression language. There was no scheme. Um, who knows what the world would be like if, if I'd made scheme in the browser instead of JavaScript. You know, scheme's very beautiful. It's kind of a research language. It doesn't have a standard library that you need. Um, it's hard to say it would have been you know, better or worse. It would have been a rush job in any event. But WebAssembly has this, this scheme-like syntax, which is nice. Um, and so WebAssembly is a part of the, uh, sorry, the reconvergence on Unix that's happening to make apps on the web be as capable as native apps, including threads. Um, and one proof of this is that there are a lot of games now targeting the web, not just you know, waiting for WebAssembly. They're already out there. You can run them on um, Facebook, for instance, and I'll show some. Unreal Engine 4 wants threads, so that's, that's still waiting. Um, Unity 5 supports what they call the WebGL target, which is really Asm.js and WebGL. So this is, this is real. Um, let me see if I can find my demos. All right. So I'm going to get my pointer back. There we go. Um, I've got a tiny resolution here. Let's see if I can get this. Thank you. Um, you can all read that, right? So WebAssembly, this is their, the, the GitHub.io uh, page. Um, it has uh, pretty good materials you can read about on GitHub. Um, the real games I want to show you are games like um, Dead Trigger 2. This is a demo from 
let's hope it goes full screen well. Um, from Madfinger, this is a Unity game and uh, a zombie game. And it's not full screen. Thank you very much. I'm going to try changing my resolution here. Otherwise, uh, I'll get killed. <laughs> um, all right. So why didn't that full? Oh, there it is. There it is. I need this little widget here. Thank you. Ah, much better. All right. Let's go back. This is a non-player character, Dr. Adamos. He's, he's not very efficient. The nice thing about this game is that uh, you have sentry chickens to help you. <laughs> so I don't have to do anything with my axe. And Dr. Adamos, who tends to run out of ammunition and just sit there dry firing and calling for help. The chickens can help him too. The problem with the chickens is that they, they have machine guns on their backs that overheat and explode. And then my chickens die. It's very sad. Um, but uh, you can respawn them. So they, yeah, this is a WebGL AsmJS game. It's running smoothly 60 frames a second. Oh, he's so useless. Come on. Uh, apologies. <laughs> anyway, where are the chickens? The chickens kind of linger. Let's see if I can get some more chickens. Come on, chickens. They get stuck, too. They, they get stuck behind gates and things like that. Here they come. Come on, chickens. <laughs> all right, all right. All right, that's enough of that. Um, then there's, let's see. What is this game? This is, um, oh, this is fun, too. This is Ski Safari. N no violence in this one. There's, there's, Santa Claus. This one is also, uh, this is on Facebook. It's a, a Unity game, I believe. Um, you have a Yeti to, to run on. I think I won that. Oh, yeah. He, he becomes a, a sled. He kind of whines a little bit. But yeah, you can, you can do uh, game retargeting, which the game designers love. Come on. <laughs> yep. Otherwise, the avalanche will get really. Yeah, I'm back on my Yeti. Yes. The penguins, the penguins riding too. Oh, I lost the penguin. Oh. So yeah, real-time games. Now it's easier to do a game that's using, you know, a GPU well. That's that's using a fixed amount of memory. Um, yeah, my, my mad skills are on display here. Uh, but but apps that that have garbage collected languages. I don't know. You know, we're still working on that. 60 frames a second. I think I'll just play this for a while. Got the penguin back, yes. Oh. Poor Yeti. Alright. Flip. Rocket. Oh. Alright. So anyway, I, I encourage you to, to, to check these games out. Let's see, I have a Brave demo. Where is my Brave demo here? Uh, I should talk briefly about Brave. The one thing I'll say about Brave is that it, it's privacy oriented. We're not really out to fix advertising because advertising may be you know, inherently stupid. Uh, but um, things like, let's see, can I even get a full screen ex experience here? I don't know. Things like a micropayments API would be cool. Um, maybe I have that in a, in a keynote I can show you. Um, yeah, that, let's do that. Um, Imagine you, you browse for a month and you, your top sites turn out to look like these 10 sites. And you're, you're blocking ads on them, so they're not getting any money. So the next month, because you have some money in your wallet that we made for you, maybe we gave you the money, um, you can start paying those sites. How many people would like that? Would you prefer to pay sites instead of see ads on them? Is that, is that interesting to you? Good, good. Well, we're working on that at, at Brave, so I hope you'll give us a try. We're, we're pre-1.0. We're, st we're still you know, getting things together. Um, I can show you something in Brave. Let me see if I can find it. Where is, there it is. This is, uh, again, my tiny mouse is going to be a problem here. Um, this is the demo for um, WebAssembly. It's called Angry Bots, I believe. It's a Unity-based demo. So I, thank goodness I can full screen. And um, I have to get a permission. OK, OK, can you go full screen, it's OK. Come on. Full screen, please. Ah, must be a brave bug. So, no chickens. 
but um, this game also is cross compiled C++ and it goes through WebAssembly and then it loads um, a little library to translate WebAssembly back to ASM.js because we don't yet have the full WebAssembly compiler pipeline in, in the browsers. But I did want to show that this is coming along to the point where you can actually load WebAssembly, which is faster to load than ASM.js. As I mentioned, ASM.js is just bigger. It's more verbose. It's JavaScript, not bitcode. Um, let me go back to here. And so I don't know how much farther we have to go to really reach uh, a kind of equivalency between native and web. I think it's always possible that you'll, you know, we'll get into AR and VR and um, there'll be new APIs. People have native devices they wear now. I was talking to someone at dinner last night who was worried about the data collection problem because if it's your data, wh why do you want it to go up into the cloud? Why should um, Fitbit own your heart rate, right? That belongs to you. This is a principle that we're advancing at Brave. Your data belongs to you. You should have access and control of it. You should, you should be the one to make, make, make some money off of it if that's what you're trying to do or keep it private if you don't like that. But um, at some point, I think native and the web will, will converge in a very powerful way, and that's why I say always bet on JS. It's kind of a joke, right? JavaScript got there early enough, and it was good enough, even though it had problems, heaven knows. Uh, and, and, and it's continued to evolve, which took competition and cooperation in the standards bodies based on balance in the market and web developers who brought their talents to bear. And that's still happening, so I say always bet on JS, and I added WebAssembly at the bottom. Thanks very much. <laughs> Happy to take questions about any of this nonsense, or just play some more games if you want. <laughs> no questions? I, I, the question's about React and TypeScript and adding sort of things to JavaScript. I think I know what you mean. Uh, frameworks, <laughs> I've been around since Dojo was, was supposed to sweep everything before it, and then jQuery came out of the blue. Um, I try not to pick favorites among frameworks. We use React as part of Electron at Brave. Um, React is, is, is doing interesting things. It's pushed this idea of immutability. Um, which is going into the, the standards work in JavaScript. So immutable data, uh, virtual DOMs, you know, diffing. Um, that, that's, that's a powerful idea. I think that actually has laid to rest this older idea that you want a big mutable model and then you want some kind of observer API to watch the mutations happen. I think that's, that's actually fallen by the wayside. That was something that from the Polymer work at Google that was leading to object.observe in the standards body, which didn't happen. Um, React is a Facebook thing, so you end up with, you have to use JSX if you're really doing it right, and you start getting pulled into other things like Redux. It's all fine if you want to get into it. It, it seems a little bit um, tied together with those things. And I, know, I have friends who work on Ember, for instance, and I, I, I know the Angular people as well. So I think it's important to have competition among these frameworks before we figure out what the primitives, the, the bottom-up pieces, the extensible web manifesto kernel elements are that we should standardize. If we prematurely standardized React, that would be a disaster. And JSX, it, I actually like it. It's, it's reminiscent of E4X. How many people remember E4X, ECMAScript for XML, yes? Um, which I was the second implementer of, I think, or maybe third after Flash, around the same time as Flash. Anyway, JSX is going to be a hard sell in the standards body. I'll just say that. Um, and and in, in some ways, you don't necessarily want to have uh, JavaScript be on the outside of everything on the web. You want HTML to be on the outside. That's the container language. That's where the, the fast rendering can happen. That's where if you're mostly texty or even user interface panels, flexible box layout, HTML on the outside wins. Y you've seen people, I've seen this on Twitter. I've seen some of the Google guys talk back to it. People write too much JavaScript, and it takes too long to load on mobile, and it runs too long. And then after it runs, you finally see the app render. And so then they do server-side rendering to try to you know, make a fast start. And they try to make it sort of rehydrate from the server-side rendering to come to life with, with client-side JavaScript that doesn't run all at once and take too long. Um, I won't, again, I'm not going to bash React. I think there, there's a, a sort of mutual 
struggle to find a way to have the best of the web and the best of native, which means fast startup, load it from the page, no you know, install process, no whiny apps that want to be updated, but, but have it really perform well, have it, have it come to life right away, have it be touch responsive, have it um, always be, be, be snappy. And that, um, that process continues. And that, that requires things like React. That they're using TypeScript and that, uh, or Flow in the case of Facebook, React, uh, TypeScript is Angular, right? That, and also bits of Ember, too, are using TypeScript now. TypeScript is awesome. One of the things that happened, um, I alluded to, is a secret meeting with Microsoft to get them on board ASM.js to WebAssembly. That was with Anders Helsberg. And of course, Anders created you know, C Sharp and .NET and did great work in Borland before that. Anders really uh, took to JavaScript and made TypeScript be what he would want and what his team would want. And they bootstrapped the whole Visual Studio tool for it in TypeScript. And I think it's, it's great. It's, it's taken off. Um, Flow from Facebook's a more advanced type system, but it doesn't seem to be quite catching on. It's, it's a slower tool. That, again, I like things about Flow. I, like the, I know the guys that built it. Um, it's got a deeper inference, so it's more convenient. But TypeScript, where you have to write, maybe you have to write more types than you ought to, is still pretty powerful. Um, there, there's an issue of standardization. If we try to standardize a, a sort of gradual type system or an optional type system, uh, there are some open research questions, like how do modules that are dynamically typed interact with modules that are more statically typed? And you know, people have, have done work on this. There's, there's I think, almost uh, complete research work on this with things like typed racket, but that's not JavaScript. So, to get that work to be done in the context of the ECMA standard will, will take a while longer. What we've done is we've reserved the colon annotation syntax. So what, and JavaScript allows extensions. That's how we got here. It's how I added things in the late 90s, like getters and setters, uh, things that became part of ES5. But we don't want engines going off and adding their own colon type annotations that are not interoperable. So we've reserved the colon after the name of the variable, the declarator name in the var declaration or in formal parameter lists or after the head of the function. For the return type, we reserve that for a future standard. And that means that when we get some kind of con concrete result for TypeScript as the standard for JavaScript, or maybe it's a flow TypeScript love child that they have down the road, um, when that research is done, we can put it in the language. And it will be optional, it will be gradual, it will work well with modules. We, we, I, what that means to me is you want things like um, contracts and blame. You want dynamic errors uh, that come to you from untyped JavaScript not to just blow up your typed code. You want a nice blame pointer that identifies the dynamic code. Um, by its coordinates. And that, that, that will come. I think that's already underway. Um, the other thing that might come into JavaScript is sweet JS, hygienic macros for JavaScript. It's hard to do that in the browser. Nobody likes adding more delays and staging, um, you know, reader and, and evaluator staging for macros, hygienic macros. But you, it's, it, sweet JS exists as a tool today. You can run it ahead of time, expand your macros, away you go. So um, I hope that answers your question. That was, I said a lot. <laughs> I, we're using React. It's part of this evolving framework story. Um, I think, think it'll, it'll keep going. And, and to the extent the frameworks learn from each other, good things will happen. Thanks. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's not just React versus Angular or whatever. It's also like. Android versus iPhone, and uh, Facebook app, uh, and Facebook instant articles versus you know other things. Uh, these are you know very powerful companies. Um, I've, I've I've lived long enough to see some rise and fall. I mean, Microsoft is not what it was, and and it's great that it's being more open. In some ways, that's just a consequence of the game theory, um, not having a smartphone presence and having to make apps on different mobile OSs and, and, and trying to embrace JavaScript uh, instead of pushing yet another uh, proprietary solution like Silverlight tried. Um, I think Facebook is, is fairly well web aligned, but they tend to be, you know, since they're, they have such great buildings and lunches, they tend to work just more among themselves. Um, and, and they certainly are sort of breaking compatibility fairly, 
fairly quickly from what I hear. Um, that has to slow down, I mean, just inevitably. And then you'll need you know, new frameworks or new things that you can iterate faster on. Um, in, in the standards body, we've gone from just the browser vendors being there. Well, actually, I should tell the full story. When we took JavaScript for standardization, we took it to ECMA because they had already made Microsoft mad in Europe by trying to standardize the Win, Windows 3.1 API. Because the European governments said we're depending on Windows, we, we need the API to be standardized. Microsoft didn't do it, so ECMA did and even got threatened legally, but got away with it. So we took JavaScript there and we had Sun on our side and Microsoft joined. And actually Microsoft leaned in and it led to the ECMA first edition standard. But after <laughs> Internet Explorer killed Netscape, um, Netscape helped kill itself, uh, the standards body basically went away. They mothballed the work on early ES4, uh, JS2, and in 2003 they shut it down. So we had to do Firefox at Mozilla to restart it. And we restarted it and we had Adobe, originally Macromedia there, because they had done a version of JavaScript for the Flash player. It took competition among the browser vendors and some fear of Flash to get everybody back together. And Apple didn't even come at first. Opera came. Opera was, was good. Microsoft was there, but they were like, yeah, we're not going to do anything for a while on JavaScript. So we did E4X. We did a few other things that didn't really help, um, except to get the band you know, back together and tuning their instruments together. Um, by the time we, we got really serious and Firefox was taking share from Internet Explorer, we had you know, Apple, Microsoft, um, Mozilla, Opera, and Google, which hadn't you know, done Chrome. Chrome was started in 2006, um, but Google was there um, even then because they were using JavaScript so much. And that brought in people like Doug Crockford of Yahoo in 2006 and other big websites that are joining. So then we added like the PayPals and the Ebays. Um, Facebook came eventually, Twitter. And now the standards body has gone to the unicorn. So now we have Airbnb, um, Twitter, who else? Do we have any other unicorns? I don't know, I don't know. Unicorns may not make it, so. <laughs> but, but the standards body is big. Some of the meetings are, are the biggest I've ever seen. And all I can say is developers, you, people, have to insist on standards. Not, not in a stagnant sense, but in a living sense that keeps improving and competing with the native agendas and, and the sort of proprietary solutions that these companies try. And if you do that, and there's balance in the market so that they have to compete for your favor, then I think things will work out. But you know, I can't say more than that. There's no general solution to duopolies or monopolies. They happen. Yeah, uh, the, the Chinese companies, I think um, n not all of them are targeting the West. Like Xiaomi is doing phones in different regions outside China. Um, but they're pretty much Android phones. I think they use Google mobile services. In China, they do not. Of course, they use other services. And uh, they're doing bots now, too. There's no uh, standards participation that I can tell there. Samsung has, has come to some of our meetings Samsung has been involved in W3C for many years. I have some friends there who, who've worked on standards. Samsung was helpful for Tizen while we were doing Firefox OS to add things like battery status API for telling how much charge was in your battery. Um, but the, the Chinese are not really there. I think at ECMA, they brought a, their version of sort of Wi-Fi 802.11 standards to ECMA, and they got treated badly by the Western wireless radio superpowers. And you know, maybe they'd hacked the standard in some way, or who knows. So they went away mad. They just said, you know, that's OK. We'll just do our thing in China. And, and they have you know, a forked version of a lot of what well, looks like a forked version of Western standards there. Um, this, is, this is potentially a problem. Uh, right now, there's the Great Firewall, so there's some sort of you know, distance between that web and the rest of the web. Uh, and, and they're very quick to adapt. So I think you know, technically winning solutions will make it across there. Sometimes they'll have funky changes. Getting things back into the standards, not happening, in my experience. Yes. Well, how, how far along is this? 
So Lars Hansen, a friend of mine, he used to be at, at Opera. He wrote the Futark engine. He went to Adobe to work on ActionScript uh, AVM2. He's at Mozilla, and he's got, uh, along with um, JF Bastian at Google, who used to work on native client, portable native client, they're working on getting this into WebAssembly. Let me see if I can, uh, I'm not going to mess with my screen. Uh, they, they have uh, code on GitHub. They have code in the engines. Um, it's under a flag in Chrome. And it's actually broken in Firefox Nightly. I'm not sure why, so I couldn't demo it. But they have Atomics as an object, an API sort of namespace object in JavaScript. It's, it's inspired by the, the fast uh, user level uh, mutexes in Linux. So there's futex wait, futex wake. There are the usual compare and swap and uh, barrier instructions and spin lock sort of primitives. And the, the only memory that can be shared is in a, a contiguous shared array buffer, so-called, which is a derivation of WebGL's array buffers, which made it into ES6. Um, I want to say five, but I think it's six. Uh, yeah, six. So you make one of these shared array buffers. You make a worker. You pass it, you, you pass it as sort of that third argument. Um, a post message, and it gets shared. Instead of being copied or handed off, transferred in, in a sort of a linear way, it gets shared. You can actually have both threads banging on it. Um, the, the semantics, thanks to work from Hans Bohm over the years on C++ and Java, the semantics are actually fairly sane. They map to the top processor architectures. There's some undefined behavior, but it's not what is called a nasal demon. I, I hesitate to use this phrase, but I think you know what I mean. The C++ people have talked about nasal demons where you, you, it, there's a lot of undefined behavior in C and C++. It, for a long time, the compiler writers, the optimizers, wanted the spec to leave things undefined so they could optimize things. And I remember the GNU C compilers, people would say, oh, yes, we're going to redefine things so that if you didn't use volatile correctly, we're going to reorder loads and stores. And your code will break, but you should have known better because it was undefined behavior you were counting on. That's crazy. Um, and that's not tolerable. JavaScript is much more specified than C or, or Scheme, for that matter. Most programming languages are underspecified. JavaScript, because of the interoperation tension between the browser vendors, going back to the first edition with Microsoft contributing very well, is overspecified. There's still some gaps. So for shared array buffer, for the exact memory semantics, there's going to be some undefined behavior. But it's not going to contaminate the rest of the JavaScript world with race conditions or mystery nasal demon bugs. Um, this is coming, and I, as I say, if we could only have it in WebAssembly, I'd be happier, because then there'd be this sort of ability to say, WebAssembly has this syntax for expressing things you cannot express in JavaScript, but there's still this shared heap. So what if you make a shared array buffer in WebAssembly, and it's connected through you know, the DOM to a, a plain old JavaScript? So it's, it's really hard to dodge having shared array buffers in JavaScript if you have them in WebAssembly. So that's what Lars and JF are working on. And, um, they still have to get through, through some hoops. I don't know if people uh, who follow security here might know about Rowhammer. Uh, Rowhammer, and there's something called Rowhammer JS, which isn't quite the same thing. But you can use JavaScript uh, to probe a, a, what's essentially a timing channel, like the L3 cache has a pretty big delay associated with it. So you can sort of f attack a program that's running by seeing when it misses the L3 cache. And if you know enough about that program structure, it's you know a white box you're attacking. You can get bits out of it. If it's a program that's validating a credit card number, you could attack it through this timing channel and learn things about the credit card number just by hammering on memory from JavaScript um, and measuring timing. So, because part of what this uh, shared memory gives you is a very fast timer just by spinning. And you know, there were problems with the web performance API in W3C, which gives you microsecond res resolution. Even that, there was a paper done um, at US University, I'm forgetting which one. Uh, it might have been NYU. They said, hey, we can use this performance, high resolution performance uh, time source to probe the L3 cache and attack a program. Um, this is not a problem unique to the threads and shared array buffer. It happened with the performance counter. It's kind of inevitable with remote code. If you load remote code and it's running in a virtual machine and, and you don't have strong isolation, like hardware isolation, it can probably get some bits out of other programs through timing channels. There's no solution in general that I know of here. Um, so in the committee, people say, oh, we, this timing channel's off and we can't add threads. And it's like, wait a minute. We already did the performance, high performance counter uh, timing uh, API. We already leaked some bits. Uh, so I think this will make it. But I think it's going to be facing some hurdles like that. 
And I, I, I wonder if I'm out of time. I think I'm, I still have a few more minutes if anybody has more questions. Yes. I, I'm so embarrassed because I said I would get those in, uh, and then I started a startup, Brave. So I haven't had any time to work on it. Uh, and and it's, it's, it's predicated on this SIMD work. How many people know what, what SIMD is, single instruction multiple data? Short vector units in your, all your common hardware. So that API uh, is in, uh, I think, in good shape. It's in stage three in the process of getting into a future ES 2017 standard, say. Um, it, it's based on work from Intel, uh, Google, John McCutcheon and team, and then now lately Daniel Ehrenberg and uh, Mozilla, which implemented it as well fully. Um, the SIMD uh, API lets you use these short vectors to do parallel, you know, 32-bit, four, four 32-bit ads or multiplies. Those uh, vectors need to be objects. People generally want them not to have um, mutable reference semantics. They want them to be like objects. So the SIMD spec work is paving the way for 64-bit integer work. Even though those are 128-bit vectors, 64 bits or even 128-bit integers are possible too. And so based on that work, I think we'll have 64 bits in a future standard. But I haven't been working on it lately, I'm sorry to say. And so people are still dealing with 53 bits of Mantissa precision in JavaScript numbers or else they're using uh, you know, array buffers, pairs of integers. If you look at all the, like Google Finance and all these other sites, they've coped long ago. They, they have their own big num libraries in JavaScript, which can be quite efficient. You can even do a sort of asm.js version of big num, uh, big integer library, and it can work pretty well. Uh, but it should be in the language, absolutely. 64 bits should be in the language. Arbitrary precision integers, I think, should be in the language. So another area that I was working on before I started Brave was value types as a general framework. We don't want to be in the business of minting fresh, primitive data types like 64-bit integers. Oh, then we have to do big integers. Then we have to do complex numbers. We want you to be able to do that with facilities in the language for declaring new value types. And so that's, that's coming also based on the SIMD work. Um, it'll have sort of an API flavor, but it will also have very important conveniences, like operators have to work, so there'll be an operator overloading scheme. Um, Suffixes, so you can write you know, a long string of digits, much more than could fit in IEEE doubles, 53-bit Mantissa, and then put a, a suffix after it like um, you know, capital L for 64-bit for signed integer, capital U for U in 64. And that will be an extensible suffix scheme as well. Um, sorry, I, I didn't talk about it because I've stalled on it because I'm doing a startup and I feel kind of bad. I'm going to come to the July meeting and try to get that going again. I'm relying on help from people at Google and Mozilla for this to happen. And Microsoft might be interested, too. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, people ask me this all the time, especially the hate one. Uh, so when I did JavaScript, I, I'm an old C hacker. I did the double equal operator. And I, I had you know a string and a number. They're not double equal. It just can't be. And then early on, in maybe June 1995, I had people inside Netscape who come from Borland. And Borland loved languages that were sloppy. Uh, they called it loose. They said, oh, it's, it's so hard. I, I, I have a form field, or I have an HTTP header in my server-side JavaScript, and I want it to just be, I want to compare it to a number. Can't you just convert it for me? And like an idiot, I gave them what they wanted. I, I said, OK, I'm going to convert it implicitly for you. And that, of course, broke transitivity. And, you know, apart from not a number, it broke a lot of properties that we all value in, in equality operators. So double equal became more like, like pearls of the time. Uh, per, Pearl had a sloppy um, equal too. It's a little different. It's fairly, fairly sloppy also, maybe less in some ways, more in others. Um, and so for the first edition of ECMAScript, I said, can't we fix this? I'm already trying to do it under a JavaScript 1.2 version. And Microsoft said, no, don't break the web. Let's add triple equals. So we added triple equals. So it isn't that double equals per se was bad. I had it right initially. But I, I actually gave in to this early adopter demand to make implicit conversions apply if the types differ. If the types are the same, it's just like triple equals. That's good. And so the lesson here is don't, don't give your early adopters what they want. The customer is always right, but the customer doesn't necessarily know what the solution is. Um, and it would have been better if I just made it so that they could have convenient conversion. Even then, you could convert from a string to a number fairly conveniently. Like leading plus might not have existed. Then unary plus is the way to do that. That's how ASM does it. Um, what do I like the most? I think the fact that, that it's functional 
And that was just a huge victory at the time because object-oriented programming was being propagandized, right? Java was all about OOP, Stevie Eggy's kingdom of nouns. You have to make a class to have a main program. You, have to, you can't have anonymous inner classes until some later version of Java, which did it. And finally, they've added lambdas. Java's actually gotten pretty nice. But, but to have functions at the beginning of JavaScript changed everything because maybe in too much of a uh, single form, I should have had you know, separate forms for separate things like constructors, but having it be a uh, first class function language, even though it's a, not a strict you know, functional language like Haskell, was a huge win and I'm still proud of that. And that was a bit of a fight. So I, I had this make it look like Java order, but I made it look like C more than Java. And I, I, I had the freedom to choose things like first class functions and prototypal inheritance. As I said, I couldn't have done classes. I would have gotten in trouble even if I had the time, which I didn't. So choosing my own primitives from unorthodox languages like uh, Scheme, sort of, its first class functions are better done, and, and Self, where prototypes uh, were most famous, that's what I'm happiest with. And on that happy note, I'll close. Thanks.